The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Bow down thine ear, O Lord, and hear us. For you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to our prayer, and attend to the voice of our supplications. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me where they are Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Glory and might be unto him forever and ever. Amen. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Our recitation for today is Psalm 1, found in your hand, or your uh, handout, excuse me. Um, we will read this responsively. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Whose leaf shall not wither. The wicked are not so. The wicked shall not stand in the judgment. For the Lord knows the way of the just. But the way of the wicked shall perish. Please be seated. Let's stop just a little bit. There we go. Okay. All right. Our reading from the Hebrew word today is from the first chapter of Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of, weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. 
Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen. The reading from the Greek word comes from the fifth chapter of Matthew, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the, on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Amen. The reading from the Latin word comes from the Arcana Celestia, first from number 9938, which the children of Israel shall sanctify, even in all their gifts of holy things, means acts of worship, representative of removal from sins. This is clear from the meaning of gifts as the inner realities of acts of worship, for those realities were represented by those acts. The inner reality of realities of worship are the fruits of love and faith. They are therefore pardonings of sins, that is, removals from them, since faith and love are the means by which the Lord moves sins away. For in the measure that the good of love and faith comes in, or what amounts to the same thing, heaven comes in, sins are removed, that is, hell is removed, the hell within the person, as well as the hell outside him. From this, it is evident what should be understood by the gifts which they made holy, that is, offered. The gifts were called holy, and giving or offering them was called sanctifying them, because they represented holy realities. For they were offered to expiate people, thus to remove them from their sins, which is accomplished by means of faith in and love to the Lord received from the Lord. Gifts and presents were said to be made to to Jehovah through Jehovah, that is, the Lord, is not the receiver of gifts or presents, but the giver of them, freely to everyone. Even so, his will is that they should come from a person as though they did so from that person himself, provided the person acknowledges that they do not actually come from him, but from the Lord. For the Lord imparts a desire to do good because he loves it and a desire to speak the truth because he believes it. The actual desire flows in from the Lord, yet appears to be inherent in the person, and so to flow from the person. 
For whatever a person does out of love and desire for it, he does from his life, love being what composes anyone's life. From this, it is evident that the things that are called gifts and presents made to the Lord are by a person, are essentially gifts and presents made to a person by the Lord, and that they are called gifts and presents on account of what they appear to be. All who are wise at heart recognize this appearance, but not so the simple. Yet their gifts and presents are acceptable so far as they are made in ignorance that has innocence within it. Innocence is the good of love to God and dwells within ignorance, especially with the wise at heart. Those who are wise at heart know, indeed perceive, that nothing whatever of the wisdom within themselves originates in themselves, but that the all of wisdom is attributable to the Lord, that is, the all of the good of love and the all of the truth of faith are attributable to him, and that for this reason, even with the wise, innocence dwells in ignorance. From this, it is evident that the acknowledgement of this matter, and especially the perception of it, constitutes the innocence of wisdom. And then from number 10,022, burnt offerings and sacrifices in general represented purification from evils and falsities. And since purification was represented, so too was the implantation of goodness and truth from the Lord, and also the joining together of them. For where, when a person has been purified from evils and falsities, which is brought about by the removal of them, goodness and truth from the Lord flow in. And to the extent that goodness and truth flow in, in that state, they are implanted and joined together. For the Lord is unceasingly present with goodness and truth with every person, but he is received only to the extent that evils and falsities are removed, thus to the extent that the person is purified from them. The joining together of truth and good is regeneration. Amen. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> So we are approaching Thanksgiving, and one of the rituals we always do at Thanksgiving is to bring offerings to the altar. So I picked out a sermon on bringing gifts to the altar. Um, this is on fifth chapter of Matthew 23 through 26, and was originally preached by the um, Bishop Philip Bodner, who was the Bishop of our church for a while, um, on June 25th, 1961. Um, I've edited it and abridged it a bit, so if anything has been lost or distorted in the process, that's my fault. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown in prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. From Matthew chapter 5. The Lord spoke these words when instructing his disciples about the commandment, you shall not murder. The Lord opened this commandment, showing that the evil of murder comes from hatred, and that hatred is a sin against the Lord which condemns a person. He told them that a man must not be angry with his brother rashly, that he must not call his brother worthless, nor say, you fool. These three things signified the increase of the evil of hatred from its seat in our native will into our intentions, and finally into its full confirmation when it passes into the will of our spirits. Hatred of a person is the desire to kill his or her very life and soul. We are human beings because within us is a human soul. In this soul, the Lord is present with his life, and through the soul we receive all life. Hatred of a person involves the hatred of his or her soul, of all that can come from it to him or her, and of all that is from the soul in oneself. 
We cannot hate our neighbor without hating all genuine reception of the life that inflows from our own souls. Our love for our own souls, that is, our love for the genuine reception of the Lord's life through our souls, is inseparable from the love of the soul of your neighbor. What is signified by the offering of a gift upon the altar? Literally, it referred to the burnt offerings and sacrifices of the Jewish church, which were the main part of their worship. The burnt offerings and sacrifices were called gifts to Jehovah. They represented the worship of the Lord out of genuine love and faith. The altar on which the offerings and sacrifices were made signified the Lord himself, and the gift or sacrifice upon it signified the things of faith and charity which are from the Lord, from the Arcana Celestia 9229. The altar signified the Lord as to the divine good in heaven and in the church, as well as heaven and the church as to the reception of the divine good of the Lord in Arcana Celestia 10123. The burnt offerings and sacrifices signified purification from evils and falsehoods, the implantation and conjunction of the good and true, thus regeneration by the Lord from Arcana 10,022. The offering of the materials and animals in the burnt offerings and sacrifices on the altar signified the reception of genuine goods and truths from the Lord in affection and thought after purification and the acknowledgement of those to the Lord. Calling these things gifts to the Lord signifies that they are produced by us as if of ourselves from the Lord, although in reality they are gifts from the Lord to man that we produce them for the sake of the Lord, for the honor of the Lord, and that we acknowledge that they are from the Lord with us. In the Jewish church, burnt offerings and sacrifices were offered for many things. They had a daily sacrifice in the morning and the evening. Offerings were made for many kinds of sin, for consecrations and inauguration, on every Sabbath and new moon and for every feast. There were so many occasions on which they were commanded to make their burnt offerings and sacrifices that it was as if their whole life were bound by them. This was representative of the Lord's will that our whole life should be from him and that we should withhold nothing of it from him. The multitude of the offerings commanded for the Jews represented the lifting up and regeneration of our entire human by the Lord. In the future, each one of these offerings and sacrifices will be filled with meaning for the church, which will see in them the purification of every essential human thought and feeling, the implantation of the Lord's good and true in them, and the conjunction of the good and true in them, whereby they become wholly the Lord's in us. In general, we can feel in the offering of a gift upon the altar our love of the Lord, our desire to worship and serve him, to be of use in his kingdom, to live and produce something for his glory and honor. Bringing a gift to the altar is bringing the things of our thoughts and feelings before the Lord in his divine human, that the Lord might receive them. If they are from him with us, they are acceptable. If they are not from him, but in any measure from hell, then they are not acceptable. Bringing the gift to the altar, therefore, is to come into a state in which there is some perception of the quality of our thoughts and affections and what is of the Lord and of self within them. It is, as it were, an exploration, a comparison of the quality of the thoughts and affections with the good and true of the Lord's divine human. By this, we are brought some perception of the things in our thoughts and affections which are out of self and contrary to the good of charity. Therefore, the text says, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there, or as it is translated in the Third Testament with this, remember that your brother has something against you. The brother who has something against you is the good of charity, which is the internal affection of the true, the affection of the true for the sake of the true. That your brother has something against you signifies that within our thoughts and affections, there is something which prevents the influx of the Lord through the soul, which enables us to see and be affected by genuine internal truths. 
In general, feelings of merit and our own goodness and conceit in our intelligence are the things which prevent the influx of any genuine affection of the true. These things cause deceit to enter our affections and thoughts and make everything rest on our personal feelings, destroying all objectivity in the sight of the true so that one can neither see it nor be affected by it. The life of the true is seen then to be only in our personal relation to it. We take pride in what we decide to think and do in our lives in the good of life. From this, there is a possessiveness in us for what is good and true, out of which we attribute it to ourselves and not to the Lord. This possessiveness for what we regard as the good and true is a source of anger, despisal, and hatred. It is against all objective vision of the true and destroys all interior affection for it. It is against the good of charity because that good tells us that the good and true within us is not our own. From this same source comes all anger, despisal, and hatred of the neighbor. If it were not for our identification of the good and true that is with us with ourselves, we would not confirm these feelings within ourselves. We confirm these feelings which rise out of our hereditary nature because we think that any opposition to our will or understanding is directed against ourselves and against the good and true, which we regard as one with ourselves. The whole external plane of our life is like a field in which the interior things of our thought and feeling are represented. We cannot see the merit and conceit in ourselves on an interior plane, but we can see it in its effects in the external life. We can be conscious of enmities, anger, and hatred. And from this, we can know that there are things within us which oppose the good of charity and which are from hell. By shunning these evils, we can enable the Lord to loosen and remove the cause of them in our internals. Anyone can see that if we cannot see our neighbors objectively, if we cannot regard them and the things they do apart from the favorable or unfavorable effect on our own honor, reputation, and gain, then neither can we see the true apart from such feelings. We might be able to see the external true objectively from without because the understanding can be separated and lifted above the will, but we cannot see any internal true from within as long as such feelings are allowed to exist unopposed in us. To see such internal truths comes from the presence of heaven with us, and heaven withdraws itself where such feelings are allowed to prevail. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Leaving the gift before the altar means remaining in the end of offering our affections and thoughts to the Lord, and to remain in the comparison of those affections and thoughts to the Lord, comparisons and for those affections and thoughts with the divine human of the Lord. To go and be reconciled to our brother means to shun all enmity, anger, and hatred, as well as all possessiveness of the good and true. Only then can our affections and thoughts be purified and good and truth implanted and conjoined, making them acceptable to the Lord, and at the same time enabling us to actually acknowledge them as being of the Lord with us. Only after shunning these evils is it possible to offer a gift upon the altar. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Agreeing with the adversary is removing the things which obstruct the influx from, of the internal affection of the true. Quickly, while you are on the way with him, signifies while in the perception of the true from the Lord. It is in the providence of the Lord that our evils are permitted to appear in the external life. Everything which stirs us to anger against another is permitted, in order that the evil may come forth and be seen. Every such thing affords us a chance to see and acknowledge this evil and to shun it. Externally, the opportunity is given to come into goodwill with those who stir anger in us. This does not mean to agree with them if they are wrong, 
nor to enter into friendship with them if they remain in some evil. Instead, it means that we will have goodwill toward them out of the love of the true for the sake of the good. This must be done quickly while we are in the way with them. The opportunity to do so must not be lost. If it is lost, the anger passes into the intention and into the will where it condemns us. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. To be delivered to the judge, and by the judge to the officer, and to be cast into prison, signifies to be condemned by the true, that is, to reject also the true, and thus to be left to the hatred which is the fire of hell. The years of our life in this world are formative years. We are but vessels in need of formation in order that way we may receive and reproduce the life of the Lord which makes heaven. Anger and hatred are the burning of the love of self in the world against this truth and its life. These evil loves cause us to regard ourselves as life itself, not as a vessel of life, and they cause us to see ourselves as already formed and to resist all the leading of the Lord to form us. Every human thing in us lives from the soul and was created to be opened and formed into a vessel of the life of heaven. But selfish loves harden and close us to that life. May we shun this murder of the soul in ourselves and the hatred of the souls of others. Then the Lord's love of the salvation of human souls may be in us and our worship and our service may be acceptable to him. Amen. Please rise. And now to the one and only God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord God of mercy and love, you have given us your new commandment that we should love one another as you have loved us. We pray that you bestow on us a mind forgetful of ill will to our neighbor, a conscience free of evil thought or design, and a heart sincere in keeping your commandments, that mutual love may prevail on earth and your heavenly kingdom be established to endure forever. Amen. Be gracious unto me, O God, according to thy mercy, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy generous spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen.